On March 23, 1984, Warner Brothers released Police Academy into theaters. Produced on a budget of $4.5 million, the film was an unexpected sleeper hit and made $150 million in the box office. It went on to spawn six sequels, a TV series, and a children's cartoon, but each film was more and more critically and commercially despised until the franchise was nothing more than a punchline. This is it, our first day of Police Academy 4. I got Mongolian barbecue and Police Academy. Mission to Moscow. Frank, 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 I'm, I gotta stop you. Uh, tonight is really not the best night for that. Why do you think I took in all those Police Academy movies? For fun? Well, I didn't hear anybody laughing, did you? In memory of this classic Slobs vs. Snobs franchise, Geekscape has decided to make the definitive ranking of the franchise with two of our biggest masochists. Robert Bacon, the host of 91 Donkey Lane and Adam Sandler, Please Stop, and myself, Matt Kelly of Horror Movie Night and Weird Algorithm. The two of us watched all seven films separately and came together to collaborate on this list. We traded picking movie placements, each of us equipped with a single chance to veto a movie to move its placement a little bit higher. And now, we are excited to provide you with our definitive rankings. This is not what I'm wearing for this. Okay, that's fine. Once. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know if this is how you're telling me that Ruth is expecting, or you just bought a silly shirt for yourself. <laughs> don't you remember the shirt from the movie? Oh, duh, yes. It's not in black, but I didn't want to get the white because it looked disgusting on Number seven, Police Academy 3, Back in Training. Police Academy 3. Got it. The state says it can no longer afford two police academies. We better, better call Mahoney. When the governor of the state announces that budget cuts necessitate the closure of the worst of the two police academies, the loyal cadets of Sergeant Lassard make sure that their home stays and that the academy belonging to the anonymously evil Cadet Mauser is closed. Bacon, I got to tell you, I think that if I was going to say what the worst one of these movies is, uh, something that shocked me, I'll start with this. I wanted okay. to see what the internet's opinion of the Police Academy movies were. And of course, I found a bunch of stuff that was full of snark. I was blown away that the only seemingly general, like genuine ranking list put this as the number one best Police Academy movie because I personally think this is the worst one police academy three back to training i think that this movie's misogynistic as hell it's right and and i'm saying this in the lens of an of a police academy movie but what makes a police academy movie a police academy movie the misogyny the racism the boobies these things the police academy isn't even that important in the police academy movies but I will, I will agree with you. I 100% agree with you on that. The re overall review I gave of this was, this is uh, super racist, even for a police academy movie. Well, and it's because they introduce the Asian cadet, mm. who I don't yeah. think, he, sh he shows up in like one of the random sequels for like a millisecond, but that's it. He's literally just there for some of the most offensive, racist Asian jokes I've heard in a long ass time. They just keep repeating bits. Like yeah. the they, they, they just keep going back to the old well. And this is the one that is just like over the top where like they repeat a mirror bit that's in another one of the movies. They repeat... Uh, that Mauser, this is one of the two films that we get, uh, Lieutenant Mauser, has, like, something done to his body and asks uh, Proctor to fix it. And Proctor, like, dramatically moves the mirror around so he can't see how bad of a job he did. And yeah. this is the third movie in a row where they go to the Blue Oyster gay bar. Like, they just keep going this same set piece over and over again. <laughs> I personally love the Blue Oyster Bar. I can't believe how like important it is in the Police Academy movies. <laughs> how much mileage they remember. get out of it. It's, it's insane. It's yeah. In this city, we the one place that we visit the most in the city of Metropolitan or they just call it city. Uh it is the Blue Oyster Bar. We that's the most place we ever go. That's 
it's so weird. It's it's weird, but also, that. and and this is something I wrote down uh, in my notes for a lot of the movies. Weirdly, to me, as as offensive, and as we just said, racist and misogynistic as these movies get, weirdly kind of tame on like being homophobic about the Blue Oyster Bar. Like it's just kind of yes. like it's there. And like that's it's like the it's like the uh, gay bar in The Simpsons. Yeah, like it's like there's no joke about like them being effeminate in there or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just the joke of the scene is, hey, check it out, this straight guy's there, and he doesn't feel like he can leave without looking bad, so he just toughs it out for a bit. (laughs) And those guys are sharks, though. Every time it's like (laughs) that that bar is just filled with sharks, and a minnow was dropped in every single time. They're like, ooh, yes. They, I can't believe uh, how they just jump on them immediately. And yes, that is probably the most tamest thing about this because looking through my notes again, sometimes I just gave up and I just wrote sexist uh, at uh, at 12 minutes, 37 seconds, sexist at 15 minutes, racist at 16 minutes and 22 seconds, racist. Not even a full 90 seconds from the last racist. This is also so... This has what I think are some of the weakest usages of Michael Winslow in this movie. Because his bits in this movie is like he's making fun of someone's first date, like overemphasizing chewing. It's so, so hacky. I will say throughout all of Police Academy, Michael Winslow is not used creatively enough. They kind of just figure out one little thing to do with them and they kind of go with it. I, out of all the things that they do, the repeating bit of him doing the uh, Kung Fu movie where it's dubbed over and the voices don't match the lips moving, like, how many times did we see that? That shows up in this one. It kind of adds to the racism of it. This one probably worse Michael Winslow, yeah. And if I'm going to give any points to some of the later, goofier uh, Police Academy sequels, I do think that they let Michael Winslow do much stranger things in yes. the later movies. Like Now, do you think, do you think Michael Winslow got better? As the Police Academy movies went on, like he got better with his sound effects and his voice, or was he always that great and they were holding him back? The I time? I think that it's probably a little bit of both. Um, the only other thing okay. that needs to be brought up in this movie is this is the film that has the first, but I don't think the last random musical performance in the middle of it when they're at like the police commissioner's ball and they get up and do a song for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I was that was that their Top Gun bar moment i think so is that what they're trying to do what are they trying to do here (laughs) (laughs) they're trying to show that they're the likable police academy that should be kept open which is like for the that's the whole plot of this entire movie is two police academy academies battling each other on who gets to stay in the nondescript city (laughs) and you know what out of all the police academy plots I don't think that is the worst idea. No. I think that was a pretty good idea. I love team movies. They already kind of are ripping off Animal House and like Stripes from the first one. And I love it when it's like, all right, now we got two dumb teams going off against each other. You know, you that should be double the amount of dumb jokes. And we don't get it. We don't. We don't. Real missed opportunities. I agree. I agree. Number six, Police Academy, Mission to Moscow. After half a century of opposition, the two largest world powers have finally begun working together. But now, just when we thought the Cold War was over, leave it to these guys to heat it up again. Lassard's team of misfits are sent to Russia to help capture an international crime figure. Let's talk about the biggest box office bomb in the history of Police Academy at number six. Police Academy Mission to Moscow, a movie that made $128,000 on its $10 million budget. (laughs) Which is, here's the other thing, though. 
this must be the most stacked cast that any Police Academy movie has ever had. We've got mm -hmm. Ron Perlman, Christopher Lee, and I never remember her name, but the girl from Mallrats, Claire Far <laughs> Farallani, I think is how you pronounce it, all in this movie. It's insane that like these big names are here. This came out five years after the last film. And if that wasn't clear that it's been five years, it's it's definitely shows with how many cast members did not come back for this movie. I'm going to say out of all of them, probably the one that disappointed me the most, because if you watch these police academies, you start noticing that they're kind of like the Saw movies where they were making one a year, one a just year shooting them out. And this was the first one where I was like, wow, they've actually taken some time between them. <laughs> uh, five years, you know? Yeah. <laughs> A lot. It, it was nice watching the years go by, watching the police academies, watching how the fashion changed a little bit. And I was kind of excited for a bigger time jump. You know, I was really excited for that. And then, you know, it happens and it's really slow. It's not very good. I will say probably one of the biggest reasons why I didn't make any money back, because I do believe this is the only police academy movie that opens up not on the shot of the city. Yep. Every police academy starts out it they change the shot every now and then but this is the first one no shot of the city and that's my first note i knew things were bad i knew things were bad right then something else that's really strange in this movie we were talking about michael winslow earlier this is the first film in this franchise that i can think of where there are so many goofy sound effects that are not coming from michael winslow they're just in the world of the movie like characters bouncing off of things and it's a giant spring noise or or like they get punched and it's like a boom punch into this yes. like it's just like cartoon logic and I I don't think it's an accident that shortly after this movie is when we get the two seasons of the Police Academy animated series that I grew up watching. You watched? You grew up watching those? Grew up watching it. I had the toys. You should be in jail. They had you Police Academy jail. toys. I was all. I in. remember those. I was all. I remember in. those. But yeah, I mean, this is this is the most cartoony of the the franchise but again talking about michael winslow if we're talking about how he got stranger this has one of the strangest things he's ever done which is the human blender bit where he's behind the bar and he like yes. pours a bunch of stuff in his mouth and pretends to turn his face on like a blender and then spits it into the cup oh my god i gagged i gagged at that and then i gagged at egg to egg one person shoots an egg out of their mouth into, into another, another person's, person's mouth. mouth. Yeah. And I think they do it twice. It's, it's, it's a lot of egg swapping. And I didn't enjoy the egg swapping. Um, you know, Bacon, we were talking about all the signs that this was going to be bad. This is also the only Police Academy film besides the first one that doesn't have a number in it. It was like they were trying to hide that this was the seventh movie. When they were releasing it in 1994, they thought maybe people will forget that there was six other films Maybe they thought like, oh, maybe I missed one along the way that I didn't know. Like, oh, I didn't know that. Or maybe they were just banking on the fact in 1994 people were still really caring about the Cold War in Moscow, you know? There's a lot of implausible things that happen in these movies. There's a lot of logic leaps. But the idea that Russia, of all places, would say, yes, these five police officers from this precinct are exactly who we need to help us with our issue in Russia right now is like so outrageously absurd to buy into. Oh man, they are really at the bottom of the barrel reaching out to America for help with police. Are you out of your mind? Like Russia would never in a billion years be like, hmm, you know what we need? Cops from America and not the good ones. Give me the wacky ones. The wacky ones. Let's talk about something that aged like milk over 30 years. Tackleberry, who's one of my probably favorite Police Academy characters, yes. having his how dare they take away our excessive force abilities yes. bit. I was yes. like, oh, my God. In a post-George Floyd world, this is the most uncomfortable thing I could be watching it right now. <laughs> Ever dependable, always reliable, PK-24 police baton. Which, with a single blow to the body, say to the lower thigh, <laughs> render the subject completely incapacitated. <laughs> but no, no. Nowadays, this too is considered to be excessive force. 
they don't practice good finger discipline in the police academy movies. They're constantly shooting things that they shouldn't. They're mostly just kicking in doors and shooting without even looking. That's a lot what they do. And that part, that specific part in this movie where he said that line, that to me, you say it aged like milk. I said, it's been so long now, it's like a fine cheese. You know, it's like so bad. It's like blue cheese. It's so bad. You're like, oh, please sprinkle this on something else. Because it. I laughed so hard. That was probably the biggest joke I laughed at. Number five, Police Academy 6, City Under Siege. An evil crime lord is getting inside information. We've suspected that there was a leak in this precinct. Our lovable cadets are brought in to help end a crime wave sweeping the city, led by a mysterious figure and his gang of jewel thieves. This is like, you know how like there's those movies that you watched so much as a kid that when you go and watch them as an adult, you're like, I have this entire movie memorized like the back of my hand and I haven't seen it for 30 years. That was this that was this movie. <laughs> uh, my, my Tommy Boy and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Like, I have those memorized. Well, no, those mind. are good, normal, healthy ones. But this was always on anytime we got free showtime. Because anytime they gave you free showtime for a week, it was also in the lull on showtime schedule where they just had the Police Academy movies run in for a whole week. And they're like, get showtime. Get more Police Academy. And I will say what I enjoyed about it because for watching these is now I'm starting to become nostalgic during watching these. And in one of them, my notes is at 1332, I say, Fackler! (laughs) (laughs) I literally yelled it out in my own living room. And then I wrote, oh, what is wrong with me? (laughs) Which is like his character is such a lame like, everyone's got their thing, right? Like, Tackleberry's a gun nut, and, like, Laverne Hooks, the most boring character in the world, just has a whisper and then a yell. Like, that's all she's got. We don't even get the yell in the later ones. But his is just, he's clumsy. Like, just bad shit happens around him. But there is a visual gag that works so well with him that I'm embarrassed how much it made me laugh, which is when they're doing the big stakeout, and he's standing in front of a fountain picking up trash, and he pokes a hole in the ground, and you just see the fountain. Yes. As he walks away, the fountain completely goes away, and water starts spraying out of the hole. That was probably, if we're ranking Fackler bits, like, that's probably number one. And I agree with you. In the middle times, then he's just kind of knocking people over and running into everybody. He's basically a bull in a china shop, even though he's barely moving. But yeah, that was probably one of the best ones. Something I do like about this movie, I'm going to give some, this is a film I'm going to give, as the kids say, some flowers to. I like that it's a whodunit. We're trying to solve a mystery in this one. Who is Mr. Big? And it even has a Scooby-Doo ending. Yeah. (laughs) The only problem I'll say with that, Matt Kelly, is maybe if you were a child, you couldn't figure it out. But literally the first time they show him, you're like, oh, that's the mayor. (laughs) (laughs) But I do love I love that visual of like the 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 shadowy figure behind the screen like that worked for me. I got two compliments for Mike Winslow in this one, too. First of all, I it's so dumb. But I love the bit where he somehow convinces one of these gangsters that he's part robot by just like grabbing metal and doing robot noises. Good bit. That is a good bit. And I actually think that one of the most impressive things, and I've seen him do this on talk shows as well, his Jimi Hendrix bit is, to me, the peak of Michael Winslow's like vocal talents. It's so good. You You don't need a guitar when he's around like he could literally go to a campfire and just sit down. I bet he could do acoustic just as good as he does that electric guitar. That is so impressive. And it's like, I remember I showed that to somebody one time and they're like, well, I mean, he's got a distortion pedal hooked up to the microphone. I'm like, yes, still, it's impressive. It's still impressive. I remember this movie scared me as a kid. I was like, I was like six and it was two scenes. 
It was the scene where Eric Lassard finds the hideout and they start guessing him and he's banging on the door asking for help. Made me real scared. I thought they were legitimately going to kill one of the police academy guys. And then obviously the effect of them ripping this mask off of the bear's face oh my is God. kind of gnarly <laughs> to watch. It is a Mission Impossible level mask. It is so detailed. It is so perfect. That is strange. That would haunt my dreams as a child. You shouldn't have been allowed to watch this movie. Number four, Police Academy 2, their first assignment. Lock your doors. Activate the dog. Stand up the man. Stretch the wire because they've taken to the streets. Our newly graduated cadets are sent to one of the worst precincts in the city to improve its conditions. While Lieutenant Mauser undermines their attempts in an effort to get Captain Lassar fired and become the new captain. I'd say uh, their first assignment, pretty big disappointment. Again, they're doing it right after the last one. I have a feeling like this one was probably one of the more rushed ones because they just did that first one, and then they're like, oh, it turned out to do way better than we expected. We got to make another one. That's kind. I have no idea. Maybe you know the story I, behind this. I genuinely don't. Um, but what I So there are some, some things to like in this movie. First of all, it introduces the character of Zed. God bless Bobcat Goldthwait. He is such a breath of fresh air in some of these sequels. He, underutilized in almost every one of the films, but is like perfect when he's there. That's my review of this film. Uh, my review, Police Academy 2, their first assignment, needs more Bobcat. Not enough Bobcat. There's a line that he delivers in this movie that I'm confident he came up with himself and that it wasn't from the writers, which is towards the end of the movie where he bumps into the mayor and he just goes, are you the mayor? I voted for you. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Ah, uh, He has so many little lines in this movie that are so good. And this is like, I don't, see enough of bobcat as the bad guy like he like being a such a intimidating bad guy like he is in this one and i really love that about this one and i think he's a great bad guy i'm glad that they just shoehorn him in later and just be like he's a good guy now he's part of the team don't care love having him love alive. it well and because this establishes something that they continue with a lot of the later movies which is like him and his partnership with uh sweet chuck uh, the the shop owner, which another bit I, I wrote kind of a solid joke is the beginning of this movie and his over the top security system of like literally an electric fence dropping down in front of his store. I was like, this is this is the right level of absurd cartoon that I wish these movies leaned into more than they actually do. Now, one of them that we haven't mentioned yet is pretty high ranking for me because it is just a cart. It is a cartoon movie that they got actors to act in, but like this is perfect. I think Mauser is such a step down from Harris. Harris is just so easy to hate that Mauser kind of takes a lot of the wind out of the sails, but I do love that. It's how we get Proctor because Proctor brings me a weird amount of joy. Yes. And when you're more excited about the henchman than the bad guy, the, that kind of shows a lot. That's not a good sign of the movie. Uh, did you notice early on in the movie, it's the brother from the Wonder Years? Yes, is in I wrote the bratty kid from the Wonder Years and Pee-wee's Big <laughs> Adventure shows up. Yes, I scream that. I scream that. Now, also, this. so we're in the second one, and Bubba Smith, the actor... You're like, in the first one, he's a giant, like, the camera's always super low. He's like a larger-than-life character. And in the second one, they immediately take that away from him. And I kind of understand, because when they shoot him normal, I looked up the character. He's only 6'6", six, six, uh, and the character that plays Hightower is like 6'3". So there's only like a three-inch difference between both of them. And it, it kind of loses a little bit of his mystique as a character, they kind of shrink them down because they couldn't handle it after the first one. So that was also a disappointment and a reason why it should sit in the middle. I think it's worth pointing out that we've talked about two of the four movies with Steve Gutenberg and haven't mentioned mentioned him at all because Mahoney is so obnoxiously forgettable in this franchise. <laughs> I, now, I will say that. Now, when we before we started this, you know, my thoughts on Steve Gutenberg, probably the same thing as they are now. It's like, why was he such a big deal? How did he somehow become a giant movie star? Because when you watch his movies, he's not bad. And he has a semblance of charm. 
But when you do watch the Police Academy movies, when he goes away, there is something that is lost. So I think there's something about the Goots. Maybe it's his glutes in this movie. You can see his legs real good in this movie. But there is, he does add something. Because in the other movies where they try to replace Gutenberg, he can't be replaced. He, they don't do a good enough job of trying to replace him, I think. One of the people who kind of gets to step up to the, to the front of the, of the table a little bit is Tackleberry gets an entire storyline throughout this movie of meeting Kirkland, dating Kirkland, marrying Kirkland, <laughs> and then the mentions of her existence become like two quick cameos throughout the rest of the franchise. <laughs> Like, and that's a shame because you know what? I did enjoy their relationship. I enjoyed some actual love because, yeah. you know, we, we're not getting real love from Gutenberg. Gutenberg's, you know, a man floozy. He's going off. You, you know he's going to be with a different girl every movie. And it was nice to see like, oh, actual love. And I was kind of looking forward to, you know, them continuing that. And unfortunately, no. Number three, Police Academy 5, Assignment Miami Beach. Mine's going to be, I hope you don't veto this Oh, I'm about to veto it, baby. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Police Academy 5. Veto. (laughs) Assignment. No, come on. That's my worst. That's my worst. How is it? I have allowed you to climb up the charts. A film that does not deserve to be up here. Now, it is the most colorful film. Sure, I'll give you that. All right, fine, fine. I will rescind my veto. I'll rescind my veto. Beyond the top two. You could flip-flop applesauce, all these, up and down. I don't even care. I was really just, uh, I just can't believe that you like this one so much. Matt Kelly, please, please explain why this belongs at the number, convince me why it should stay at the number three slot. Because it's a bad movie. I just like it for nostalgic reasons. That's why I'm like, you know what, I can't fight this fight that hard. So I think the only other reason I would want it higher is to shock people that, it's the number one movie on this list. Oh, you ha- you you want to put this at one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's why I'm saying <laughs> well, we gotta I'm... we gotta stop the break. We gotta pump the brakes before I let that happen. So please get me okay. five number three. That's uh, I'll check myself. They're back. Come on in, register. Jones. <laughs> Hightower. <laughs> Hooks. Back off, you turkey. Callahan. I left. When Commandant Eric Lassard is recognized as the officer of the decade. The goofy gang of officers attend a convention in Florida and accidentally run into some jewel thieves. Well, can you explain why you liked it? I can explain it with two things. The fake shark and the fake alligator. There is (laughs) there is something The bar is so low. There is so so when I talk about watching part six all the time as a kid, the first moment of any police academy movie I ever saw was this fake shark scene because I love Jaws and it was on TV and my parents saw the scene happening and yelled for me. They're like, Matt, come in here quick. And I ran in just in time to see Tackleberry put a gun to the head of a shark as it swims away to the Jaws theme. And I was like, this is comedic gold. And this was the only one I had on VHS as a kid. So I'd watch this one constantly. Um, And then I promptly forgot about it. I remembered nothing about this movie when I rewatched it. In the beginning of this month, when my my beautiful girlfriend's brother bought me the box set of Police Academy as a Christmas gift, and I put this one on, this was one of those movies where I'm like, I have not thought about this movie in probably 30 years, and I am remembering every single moment of this movie, and I got excited for the shark scene to come up. I said earlier that like I like these movies when they are basically just like giant fucking cartoons and activate in cartoon logic. And this is the most cartoon logic that any of these movies get. I mean, you've got House going to the other side of a plane and the entire plane tilting until he gets back onto his side of the plane because he's so large. Like, it is, that is like a 1930s Looney Tunes joke. Like, it's like just, it's so outrageous. For some reason, this movie works for me. And this was the one I was most excited to rewatch when I realized that I had wow. to watch all seven of them again. I was like, well, at least I get to see that sweet fake gator and that fake shark again. I guess my gator moment would be at 33 minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, there's some under boob sweat just going on on everybody. 
Just everyone's real sweaty in this movie because they're in Miami proper. And you could tell it didn't look like a total fun film. To It, it didn't look like something that was super fun to film. I also think that Mike Winslow doing the hold music is so funny to me. Checking computers right now, sir. Please stand by. <laughs> but who's the joke on there? Because... He, he also has to hold with him and play the music. The reason why I didn't like it, why I wanted to put it lower on the list, you know, all, all of them don't really follow logic very well and you gotta sus suspend a lot of disbelief, but this whole like, why is he even going down there? The whole phone call. And then he says, oh, I'm going down there so I can gain all their respect again. And then continues to act exactly how he always acts and yells at them. And then he tries to pick up a woman at the bar and he's very weird about it. Well, there's also no kinda... way in this world that Lasseter is the best police officer of the decade. I will say this one has a good ending where the it's the, the fan boat ending. Yes. Yeah, so... You know, they're following the, the formula now. You know, they're like, okay, at the end, we have a big set piece. Look, and I'm going to say the unpopular opinion. I like Nick Lasseter more than I like Mahoney. Wow. That should be Police Academy. Like, uh, that's a Police Academy swear. Number two, Police Academy 4, Citizens on Patrol. The graduates are back in Police Academy. Ah! Through a new initiative called Citizens on Patrol, the officers need to work with new recruits. However, Harris and Proctor, in charge of the program, hope to cause it to fail. Listen, first of all, David Spade's in this bad boy as a skater punk. David Spade. They they almost had David Spade, the casting. They're like, we kind of need like a punk you know, smarmy kid, you know, and he is, he is a skate, annoying skater kid adjacent David Spade to me. You know, I think he does a great job in this film. I think it's really interesting watching him. I love his outfit, purple and pink. Perfect. I love the clothes in this. I love the performances. But when I saw David Spade in this one, I already knew that it was going to go up pretty high because I think he does a pretty good job playing a character that he usually doesn't play. But here's another reason why this had to rank high. This is where they use Bobcat the most and use him correctly. This is also, maybe this may or may not be why we ranked it so high. It's the only one that has a title theme. Uh, we get the Citizens on Patrol rap song. Citizens on Patrol. The song slaps. Song slaps. Did you see who it's performed by? Oh, who? Michael Winslow. Oh, that's why. This movie lets you know right away that it knows what it's doing and it's going to have some fun. And it's the fourth one. So they've kind of figured it out by now. They had their hit. They had the one that they rushed. They made another one. They're like, eh, we're, we've ran out of ideas. We need to kind of go back to something new. And again, we're at the stupid and adding to the stupid. We got the police academy. We're back at the police academy. And then it's like David Spade and his friend get forced into being part of the citizens on patrol because they just can't stop skating where they're not supposed to be skating. Yes. <laughs> That's the huge problem in this city. That's the tipping point. Also, the meanest prank I think they've ever played on Captain Harris is in this movie where they super glue a megaphone to his lips leading to him having to go to surgery to have it surgically removed from his face. He deserves it. Deserves it. Deserved every moment of it. So happy to watch him go down. Great character to always get, you know, punching. You're punching, you're punching down, but at the same time, you, he thinks he's up. So it's punching up. And I like it. The ending of this movie with the air balloon stuff, I've always remembered this ending for some reason. I'll say it. Best ending? It doesn't have a fake alligator, but it's... <laughs> it has real stunt work. Yeah. These people are up in planes, hanging off planes, and actually planes are flying around each other. There's four planes in the air because you see three, and then there's the camera, and then there's the hot air balloon. I do believe this is the only negative I will say about this one is I do believe it's the first one where she doesn't say, don't move, dirtbag. 
And then after that, it goes away. And I thought Don't Move Dirtbag was such a huge part of all these. So do you want to know how big of a part it is, Bacon? The box set that I have, because obviously they couldn't find a good review to put across the bottom of the movie. You know, like normally it would be like two thumbs way up from right. Mayan just says, just says, don't move dirtbag. Attribute it to Laverne Hooks. Wow. So they, it, it went from a selling point to completely missing from all the rest of them. And number one, Police Academy. Crime. The city was full of it. When the newly elected mayor announces a policy requiring the police department to accept all willing recruits, a group of misfits attempt to prove themselves capable of being police officers. It's the one that started them all. It's the one with the most flip transitions. It's the one with the most nudity. It's the one that plays the theme song the most. It's the one that is actually at the police academy. Let me ask you an honest question, right? If you were hanging out with friends and they said, put on a police academy movie, I don't think this is the one I'm going to grab. I admit that this is the number one one and this is the best one. But if I'm going to make my friends watch a Police Academy movie, I am going for some of those mid-tier sequels. You know what I mean? I'm going like, for four. And I'm going to go four. for five or six. Like, I want them to see some shit. I want them to be like, suffer. You suffer. <laughs> but um, this film absolutely follows a format that worked at the time, which was the slobs versus snobs, like late 70s, early 80s films. And I think when you go into those movies as a comedy fan, you you know that you're going into something problematic, right? Like Caddyshack is one of my absolute favorite movies. I know that that film is problematic as all hell. And that's like what this is in spades. But there are things that work so, so well in this movie. And and one of them doesn't make any sense. It's the most outrageous thing in possibly any of the movies. But there is one detail that makes me laugh so hard, Bacon. There is a bit where, side note, there's three characters introduced in this film that we never see again throughout the entire franchise, which is, like, George, the the lover dude. Yeah, the guy who gets every girl, yeah. There's Leslie, who the film is practically built around as, like, your underdog redemption story. He's gone forever. And there's Karen, the love interest in the movie, completely gone. But Leslie, in a cruel prank, uh, Harris's two, like, favorite students put a prostitute in his bedroom and Mahoney says, I'll get her out of here for you. And they hide underneath a pulpit or whatever, a lectern uh, as Lassiter is about to give a speech and she gives him a blow job and he proceeds to go through the speech. It's an awkward, weird scene, but son of a bitch, the sound of a very large zipper unzipping is so funny to me. Stimulating. And his response, like his facial like response to everything happening is, you know, is funny. The whole situation is like very uncomfortable now. And there was something about comedy back then. I don't know why it needed to be like going that hard. I didn't know I needed to have so much nudity considering it feels like a film that's supposed to be directed at a younger audience. I think I remember liking it as a child. It becomes a cartoon. I can't believe we start with this and it becomes an actual cartoon. This is the only R-rated film in the franchise. Second one's PG-13 and then it's PG the rest of the way. Like from three on, these are all perfectly suitable films for the whole family as far as the rating. It is unreal how insane some of these these bits are and how bad these hold up. And yeah, I mean, throw it into the giant plethora of, I can't believe they made these into cartoons for us as a kid. Cause we got a Rambo and RoboCop cartoon as kids. We got the toxic crusaders. Like the toxic Avenger is one of the most gory, shocking, offensive films of the eighties. And they were like, we can market this to kids. <laughs> like, let's do it. Yeah, but I think because when I, you know, I watched this as a kid and what I remember from it is not those scenes. I kind of remember the world that they build and the feeling that it has. And it feels like a cartoon. And when you're watching it as a kid, it's fun to watch these movies that, uh, you know, it's adults acting silly. And it still holds up in this one of they're able to build a world and they're able to set up these rules and they kind of play in those rules and they kind of have fun. 
now has it aged completely well? No, it's a comedy from from the eighties, you know. But you're right. Like the cartoon logic is like right out the gate, basically. Like we get the first scene that we see Mahoney, he's he's working as a parking attendant, and his boss is like, "You have to park this my friend's car. I don't care that there's no spots." And he manages to drive the car. <laughs> On just the two left wheels. I remember the car going up on the two wheels was big. Like, did you remember seeing that as a kid? I think that was like you go somewhere, you go to like a drag race or something. Do you ever go to drag races? All the time. You know how, yeah, you know you know, how we were in the, the 90s. Drag race. Yeah. There's drag races everywhere. You couldn't get, you know, you'd be going to the grocery store, walking to a drag race. Oh, and there's a car on the side. That was like normal. That's how people took a left hand turn. They got up on two and they went. There's one thing that we have not addressed at all in this movie, and and this is with the entire franchise, right? We had a lot of fun talking about these movies. We've probably shown all seven of these movies more respect than We've most. been talking so long, it is now dark outside. It has slowly just become black. Hey, Siri, set all lights to candle. The one thing that I do have to give some credit to for actually being great, and I truly mean this, I think that that Police Academy theme is primo. It's a good song. I love a good theme song, especially for comedy. And I like it when they use like an actual orchestra to, to play it. So there it is. That is Bacon and I's final rankings. Please let us know in the comments where you disagree. Are you like me and think that Assignment Miami Beach actually is the best of the films? Or are you like Bacon and think that it should have been at the very bottom of the list? Also, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Keep people knowing about the video. We're going to have more videos coming back to the Geekscape channel over the next few weeks. And thank you for watching.